Good evening everyone, time for another member update. So we're going to start out with the Bitcoin chart on Bitfinex. And you can see here that we're at 1235. If we got to the weekly, you can see that we're above that 1200 price that was the old high. That's really important because if you can sustain a new high territory, that means probably overhead selling resistance is exhausted. But if we go back to the three day, you can see here down at the bottom this MACD, you can see it's about to cross over and the price, uh, the MACD is reset. It's not oversold, at least on the three day chart it's not. And the price is getting ready to, looks like ready to break out into new highs. We'll see. Um, other things to note here, the OK coin price is absolutely horrible with China lagging behind Bitfinex by almost $200. Russia is lagging by just a little bit. So again, uh, from everything we can take away, the purpose of the Chinese government in doing what they did was to shut down Bitcoin trading to keep money from flowing out of their system. That's my opinion, and that opinion is not going to change until I see the uh, Chinese exchanges quoting a higher price than uh, than the or, or at least an equal price or near an equal price to what the other exchanges are quoting. Uh, you can see there are other exchanges here. BTC China uh, that's quoted in yuan, uh, but uh, still Chinese exchanges definitely lagging. So the World Coin Index we want to look at the uh, total because if you remember when I first started tracking this. It was around $10 billion. That was Bitcoin and all of them combined. Uh, now you can see that Bitcoin's around $20 billion. It's currently making move uh, right now. And uh, you've got Ethereum hanging at $4 billion. Ripple, surprisingly, is up above a $1 billion. If you're a really aggressive person, you might want to short that on a fundamental basis. I think it's a scam, but we'll see. Litecoin coming in at a half a billion, Dash coming in at half a billion, and then the rest of these. So total market cap of $30 billion, that's quite a bit. Uh, that has been steadily rising, and I expect it to probably double again to $60 billion, probably within the year, I would say. That means more money continues to flow into cryptocurrencies. But again, $30 billion is pocket change when we're talking about the money that's in the system. We're going to look at that when we look at some of the trading economic statistics. Now let's jump on over to the silver chart here. This uh, volume is absolutely shocking. We don't know what it means, but we do know that the tapering off of this volume is coinciding with the approach of the monthly MACD uh, to break out into positive territory. You can see that the upper line has crossed over at 0.01 and that's a big, big first for that. You can see uh, the last time we were above positive territory was back in early 2013 when the price was all the way up above that $26 uh, support level, which ultimately broke down. Uh, then the last time that the uh, MACD was actually below the, the zero line and crossed over on the monthly, for an uptrend, uh, the only other time that we've seen that was the beginning of the bull market. So that's very interesting. Can you imagine if we had a bull market of the magnitude of what we had here, a move of $5 to $50, so tenfold. So if we base it on 20, that a similar move like that would give us $200 silver. Now again, those are the technicals, and I don't put a lot of stock in technicals, especially when markets are manipulated, but then again, uh, they can only be manipulated for so long. At least that's my belief. Now, a lot of people have become disillusioned. I myself have become disillusioned in the sense that I don't follow all the same. For example, I, I used to go to Silver Doctors all the time, but now when I go to Silver Doctors, a lot of the stories are just kind of like a broken record. Uh, and you have some kind of questionable Bible prophecy teachers on there, and it's kind of turned into like a paid site. Zero Hedge has been fairly boring of late. There's been a lot of political content, but not a lot of economic content. So there's a lot of people be, who have become disillusioned, 
and uh, there's a lot of stackers who are expecting fireworks by this time. There were a lot of prognosticators who had promised fireworks by this time, but they just haven't happened, and everyone's asking why. Well, the reason why, uh, I'm going to give you an analogy here. Let's watch a little video, and uh, we'll get an idea of some of these sayings and what they mean. I'll say it's because the music is still playing. Uh, we haven't counted up the chairs. So this is musical chairs. Let's watch this real quick. There's some kids playing this game. So the first takeaway I want to uh, the first thing I want to mention is that we have two sayings actually that come from this. Uh, you know, a game of musical chairs, which is referred to a lot of things, and there's also when the music stops, and uh, that refers to when the music stops in a game of musical chairs. That's when everybody sits down. Now, another thing I want to point out here is you notice how happy everybody is when the music's playing and they're just going around. Now. We don't know in any game of musical chairs. It just so happens that the way you play the game is that you have the kids go, uh, go around the chairs to the music and you have one more kid than chairs. And then the music stops, everybody sits down, and one kid is left without a chair. That kid's out, you remove a chair, you start it over until you get down to one chair and a winner. But again, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a certain amount of kids it doesn't have to be a certain amount of chairs you you could have 50 kids circling around four chairs and everything's fine and dandy until the music stops and then someone is left without a chair and that's when the tears start <laughs> and uh, the point being that uh, the music is still playing and as long as this music is still playing we don't know how many uh, chairs there really are we we know that there are a lot of promises that have been made and uh, we know that there's a lot of players I suspect that we're talking about a ratio much more like ten times the number of players to the number of chairs. Now I wanted to talk about some economic statistics here because this kind of flushes out. A lot of people have been watching the stock market go up, precious metals not go up, and again this is a part of the musical chairs game that they're keeping this thing going. And when you go through these statistics on trading economics, some of them for the U.S. look really good. Some of them look really bad. Now, this is the U.S. money supply M2. And you can see that it is on, it is approaching a parabolic. It, it did a stagger. You can see that it did a stagger right there. And that was actually the financial crisis. It never did actually go down but it, it actually stopped going up at the rate that it was going up. And what happened? Well, there was a gigantic financial crisis. But you can see since that point, it's almost doubled. And uh, since the beginning of the 2000s, it's up almost fourfold. That's four times the amount of money in the system to keep this game of musical chairs going. Now, I wanted to show you some other statistics I said that a lot of the statistics look good and a, a lot of the statistics are fake, but some of these statistics, uh, even though they faked quite a few of them, uh, even so, some of these statistics look really, really bad. So one of these is the central bank balance sheet. This is basically the Fed's balance sheet, and this is the amount of financial assets, essentially bad debt that the Federal Reserve has purchased, you can see that before the financial crisis this number was below a trillion dollars and now it's hovering and it has been hovering since about 2014 between 4.5 and 5 trillion dollars. But again the Fed has not liquidated any of that and interest rates have not backed up really at all. Uh, they've done some token moves 
but nothing to speak of. Now, some others that I want to look at that are really bad, and this is going to give you an example of the musical chairs that's going on here, uh, the balance of trade. Now, we know that the balance of trade has to do with how much you, basically how much money you export for goods. Uh, in other words, uh, if you buy something from foreigners, you actually have to manufacture something and sell it to them. Uh, or you're just paying for it with paper money and you can see that we've been on that path since about 1980 or so and uh, we had kind of a recovery that happens around 1990 and then that's when we just plummeted off the cliff and we turned into a importing country that basically imports goods and serv some services and exports debt and some goods and some services so that's a really bad chart and you can see that it's turning back down again uh, it hasn't plumbed the depths that it did during the financial crisis but it's pretty bad and I want to show you the last one uh, this one is the absolute worst one here and this one shows you uh, how bad of a situation the United States really is in relative to other countries and this is called uh, United States Net International Investment Position. And you can see that it's down there around negative $8 trillion. Now, what's the definition of this? In the United States, net international investment position is the difference between a country's external financial assets and liabilities. This page provides United States net international investment position, actual values, historical data, etc., so basically this is how much uh, wealth we have relative to other countries and you can see that it's horrific and the other thing you need to take away from this is how bad it's gotten since the beginning of the financial crisis you can see at the beginning of the financial crisis it was around a trillion dollars and now it's crossing or, I'm sorry, negative trillion, and now it's crossing negative eight trillion. So that's an eight-fold uh, worsening of the net financial position of the United States. And uh, we can see with the banker wars that are still going on, with the things that they're trying to foment in the Middle East, with Syria, they're still trying to keep this game of musical chairs going. The music is still playing, but the music is going to stop. Now, I wanted to touch upon this um, concept here. This is something that uh, Steve San Angelo or SORS Rocco talks a lot about, and I don't agree with him on this uh, ex exclusively. I mean, I agree with some of the points but uh, there's a caveat there because a lot of the uh, peak oil people and uh, there was the Paul Ehrlich people who were talking about the end of uh, you know population bombs and energy bombs and stuff like that and a lot of these doomsday people have turned out to be wrong and the reason why they've turned out to be wrong is because they can't predict new uh, technologies and new technologies tend to uh, extend out whether you're talking about the amount of food I think Paul Ehrlich talked about how the world was going to starve because we couldn't produce enough food and uh, and then Steve San Angelo is constantly talking about this energy return on energy invested and this is an important concept so I'm going to talk about this uh, the economic aspect of this uh, EROEI and just read this entry here. High per capita energy use has been considered desirable as it is associated with the high standard of living based on energy intensive machines. A society will generally exploit the highest value EROEI energy sources first as those provide the most energy for the late, least effort. This is an example of David Ricardo's best first principle. Then progressively lower quality ores or energy resources are used as the higher quality ones are either exhausted or in use, for example, wind turbine position in the windiest areas. In regard to fossil fuels, when oil was originally discovered, it took an average one barrel of oil to find, extract, and process about 100 barrels of oil. 
the ratio for discovery of fossil fuels in the United States has declined steadily over the last century from about 1,000 to 1 in 1919 to only 5 to 1 in 2010. Although many qualities of an energy source matter, for example, oil is energy dense and transportable while wind is variable, when the EROEI of the main sources of energy for an economy fall, that energy becomes more difficult to obtain and its relative price increases. Therefore, the EROEI gains importance when comparing energy alternatives since expenditure of energy to obtain energy requires productive effort. As the EROEI falls, an increasing proportion of the economy has to be devoted to obtaining the same amount of net energy. And that's the key concept there. As this number falls, and you can see that it fell from 1,000 to 1 to 5 to 1, that means that a larger proportion of the economy has to be devoted to obtaining that energy. Now, why am I reading this? Well, it's to remind everybody that uh, silver is an investment that already has the energy invested in it because the energy that's in silver is the energy that it took to mine it. So when you're talking about really cheap silver, you're talking about a really cheap way of investing in that energy. Now, do I believe that, that in the future we're going to come up with some new technologies in regards to energy? I'm sure we will. I don't believe any of the, the miracle free energy sources and uh, I believe a lot of conspiracies but I don't believe the uh, cold fusion or any of the other free energy uh, conspiracies. I believe that uh, there are laws and that uh, there are natural laws that got established and, and there are set limits of resources and stupid things like mining space and mining meteors and mining the moon and things like that. Talk about a waste of energy invested. Uh, those things are never going to work. That's just stupid. So I believe this is a valid principle and I just wanted to compare the uh, energy invested with uh, silver as opposed to gold. Now right now gold is uh, you can see significantly higher relatively than silver. It has not corrected nearly as much. And a lot of people will argue that that's because of gold's monetary role, whereas silver doesn't really have a monetary role. Now, I admit that uh, that's the perception. So in, in a sense, the perception is the reality. That's part of what's suppressing silver. But I actually think that gold is, uh, is much more vulnerable than silver. And the reason why is because Silver has that industrial uh, need, and I don't think that's ever going to go away. I don't believe any of the alchemy stories like I did covered before. I don't believe the a lot of the nuclear uh, stories, and I certainly don't believe in the nuclear alchemy that they can convert one uh, mineral or one one atomic uh, number to another. Uh, I believe that there's a set amount of silver, a set amount of gold. And if you remember on the earlier part of the ER, uh, EROEI, whatever it is, the return on energy invested, when they talked about Ricardo and talked about the easy resources are taken first, that is absolutely true in the case of silver. So you're talking about so many positives here. You're talking about this energy invested. You're talking about a low price. You're talking about industrial as well as potential monetary uses. But if something like a cryptocurrency ends up succeeding, then that could be a threat to the gold price if it draws a lot of alternative investments that are pulled out of non-state uh, run currencies. That Ten, has tended in the past to be gold. Physical gold is how people protect themselves from uh, profligate state spending and uh, devaluing of their currencies because of it. And people have tended to flock to gold because of that. But if we have successful cryptocurrencies, much of that investment demand may turn to cryptocurrencies rather than to gold. Now, in regards to silver, I don't think that it's nearly as big of a threat for silver. First of all, because silver is so undervalued here relative to gold, but also because silver has so many uses. There's a lot of uses that gold has, but silver has so many more, and it's absolutely necessary. It can't be replaced. 
So when we look at this return on energy invested, it's already in the silver. It's dirt cheap. Now, we know that the musical chairs, the game is going to stop. And what's happened is, uh, if I can try to explain it this way, we've had, we're talking about the number of chairs. Now, we looked at the M2, the M, the money supply, and things like that. The Federal Reserve has controls over that. They can uh, juice the money supply and give us more money. But the thing is, is that, that they can't print uh, promises. In other words, they can't actually uh, give us more chairs. There's a set number of chairs. Those are the promises that are made to people. Uh, they can be devalued with the change in the currency, but still there's a certain number of promises out there and you don't know how many of those promises are going to be reneged upon until the music stops. And this is not like a game of musical chairs in the sense that we stop the music, we take a chair away, we start the music up again. This is a game of musical chairs for all the marbles. This is all of the people going around all of the chairs in one big game. We don't know how many people really are going around this circle. We don't know how many chairs are really there. But when the music stops, there's going to be a lot of sad faces. And we'll talk to you next time.